So before uh, memes were a really big thing, and I know I might be like aging myself a little bit here, but um, my sister had an album on Facebook titled Things That Make You Go, Hmm. And there were pictures of things that were just odd, didn't really make sense. Some things that she found on the internet, but a lot that she took herself. And so I put a couple pictures from that album. This album's like 10 years old. Uh, in your notes today, there's like a keychain uh, of a pig. There's a sign that says men working, whatever that means. Uh, and then there's a, a picture of applesauce on the, on the go. And I know that these kinds of snacks, like the applesauce on the go, is becoming more and more common and may not seem strange to us. But don't you think it's a little bit strange that we are so busy, we don't even have time to sit down and eat applesauce anymore? Like, really, how long does it take to eat applesauce? I mean, come on. That just really makes you go, hmm. And as I was reading through the Bible passage, the Bible story that we are using today, I thought, yeah, this story really belongs in that photo album. Man gets swallowed by giant fish, survive, survives three days, and is fat back out. Hmm. Interesting. We've been going through this series called Divine Encounters, looking at stories uh, in the Bible where uh, people have these dramatic encounters with God. And a part of why we're going through this series and looking at these stories is because it's so easy to forget, especially when we're busy, especially when difficult things are happening, that God is moving and active. That God created the world and everything in it. That we can live with the expectation that God is going to speak to us. God is always speaking. God is always working. God is always moving. The question is, are you paying attention? Are you paying attention? The story that we're diving into today really deser deserves its own series. It's a whole book. So I'm just asking you to bear with me as we cover a lot of material and jump around. I promise that it'll make sense. Uh, we're looking today at the book of Jonah. And if you wanna follow along in your Bible, starting with chapter one, that's great. I put the major verses that we're gonna be looking at uh, in the text. Cause again, we're gonna kind of skim through this. But in the beginning of the book of Jonah, God speaks to Jonah and says, go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it because its wickedness has come up before me. Now, this is odd for a couple of reasons. Uh, at, at this point, you know, Jonah is a prophet and God's prophets were like God's mouthpiece. They were sent to typically speak to God's people, the nation that he formed to be a blessing to all the other nations. They were sent uh, to warn God's people of the consequences of their sin. When the people were unfaithful, the prophets would call them out. And at this point, God had not sent a prophet to another nation. So it's a little bit strange here that God is sending uh, Jonah somewhere else. And it's also very odd that God wants to warn the people in Nineveh. See, Nineveh was this very wealthy and enticing uh, place. Only its wealth was built upon injustice and violence. So think District 1 or the capital of the Hunger Games, okay? Like they're living lavishly, but they celebrate and make money off of this game uh, that kills people, forces people to kill each other. I don't know if you remember the scene in the movie where they are stuffing their faces with all these delectable desserts and then they drink something so that they could throw up and eat more while people are starving. Like that's Nineveh, okay? Nineveh was the capital of Assyria. And after the Assyrians would capture their enemies, they were known for typically cutting off the legs and one arm of the enemy so that they could shake their hand as they were dying, like mocking them. They would force friends and family members to parade around with a stick with a decapitated head of their loved one around. This is like, Joffrey from Game of Thrones, okay? Like these are not friendly people. 
So Jonah decides he isn't going to go. He, he heads to Tarshish. And I don't know about you, but I'm like a little bit surprised that Jonah so easily disobeys God, like very deliberately says, nah, I'm not, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to go somewhere else. Tarshish, the city that he heads towards, uh, is very similar, wealthy city, only they didn't have the same violent reputation. And very interestingly, scholars have a hard time nailing down exactly where the city was. In Psalm 48, the ships that head to Tarshish actually have a symbolic function. I have this quote uh, from Mark Sayers in your notes. He's talking about the boats that head to Tarshish. He says, uh, they symbolize distant possibilities, a hazy future that one can dream about that promises wealth and prosperity. Is Jonah just allured by what is comfortable, the better life? Tarshish, in my mind, I don't know about you, but I'm picturing somewhere tropical, like Jonah laying down in the warm sand, a resort with an amazing brunch, bottomless mimosas and crab legs. Like Tarshish sounds great. When COVID is over, let's all go to Tarshish. Like I am in, I'm ready for a vacation. Is Jonah just enticed by something comfortable, the good life? I mean, really, why would Jonah want to say yes? Doesn't really sound like a great assignment. And yet I'm still surprised that he so like deliberately disobeys God. So clearly just heads off in the opposite direction. Doesn't even stay where he is, but just says, I'm going to go somewhere else. I wonder if he has some misconception of who God is. Like, did he hear God wrong? I could just easily see him talking himself out of this, thinking, no, like, that doesn't make any sense. God wouldn't want me to go to Nineveh. Like, Nineveh, those are evil people. They're our enemies. Why would God want to help them? God is a God of justice. That's the God that I know. God wouldn't send me there. Can't you see him doing that? You know, some people might say that our theology of God, the things that we think about God and say about God says more about us than it does about God. Does Jonah's idea of God and what God is saying say more about him than it does about God? So Jonah boards the ship and heads to Tarshish and then chaos ensues. There's this huge storm. We really shouldn't be surprised because this is kind of how it goes. When we live life on our own terms, there's consequences. Now, I'm not saying like God is like the kid with the magnifying glass trying to burn the ants, just like waiting to smite us whenever we disobey or do something wrong. And I'm not saying God is behind suffering and chaos, but I am saying in the Bible, the writers talk about this kind of wisdom that's ingrained in creation. This idea that you reap what you sow. If you go about life on your own terms, there's inherent, inherent consequences. I just finished this television series, Your Honor. I know that some of you have watched this or are watching it, but it's basically about a show. Uh, if the show is about a guy who tries to cover up this murder, and you watch as the more lies that he tells, like the more the cracks spread, the more people get involved, the more people end up getting hurt and even dying. The choices that we make have consequences. So the irony in the story, well, there's actually a lot of irony in the story. It's full of satire. The, they're on this boat, there's a storm happening and these other guys, are crying out to their gods. Like they realize this storm is like of divine proportion. Something is not right here. We need to pray. Meanwhile, Jonah is asleep. If you're a Friends fan, I know what you're thinking. You fell asleep? Yes, he fell asleep. <laughs> He's just totally peaceful while the world is in chaos. And so they wake him up and they interrogate him. They're trying to understand like, 
They're betting that he has something to do with this storm. And he does. And so they ask him, what should we do? And he says, pick me up and throw me into the sea and it will become calm. I know it's my fault that this great storm has come upon you. And they actually don't want to do that. They don't want to throw him out into the sea, but they end up having to, and they pray and they make sacrifices to the Lord. And then the text says, verse 17, the Lord provided a huge fish to swallow Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights. Now this is where things get a bit fishy. I'm sorry, that was a really bad pun, uh, but that was for you, Keely. You're welcome. Um, <laughs> yes, Jonah ends up in the belly of this fish. And whether or not you believe that this actually happened to this man named Jonah, this story, this book that we have, there's meaning and truth. It's authoritative. It's in the Bible, whether you believe that it actually happened or not, whether you believe this guy was in a fish. The text says that God provided a fish and here in this fish, Jonah has this come to Jesus moment in chapter two. It's this really beautiful prayer. I'm not gonna read through all of it just uh, for the sake of time. But he says, from deep in the realm of the dead, I called for help and you listened to my cry. When my life was ebbing away, I remembered you, Lord, and my prayer rose to you, to your holy temple. And then God tells the fish to spit him out. So the fish spits Jonah out and Jonah ends up going to Nineveh and he preaches this really beautiful, compelling sermon. His delivery is quite captivating. He's building relationships, doing the missionary thing, and, and everyone repents. Kidding, that's not actually what happens. Um, probably not what you would expect to happen. You might expect that Jonah does the absolute best that he can, and like four people decide, hey, we're going to change our ways. What we've been doing is awful, and we're going to follow Jonah's God. But actually, that's not what happens either. In verse three, chapter three, it says, Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and he went to Nineveh. And Nineveh was a very large city. It took three days to go through it. And Jonah began by going a day's journey into the city, proclaiming 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. I mean, he gives this sorry declaration. Can't even call that a sermon, just like a sentence. And it says the Ninevites believed God. Just, they just believed God. A fast was proclaimed and all of them from the greatest to the least put on sackcloth. It's, it's a, a sign of repentance, of turning away from their actions, of turning to God. And you know what happens to these ruthless, violent, selfish people? God has compassion. Verse 10, it says, when God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened. God has compassion. At the, at the end of the story in the final chapter, I mean, Jonah is enraged. The text says, but to Jonah, this seemed very wrong. And he became angry. Verse two, he prayed to the Lord isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? That is what I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. I knew that you are gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Now, Lord, take away my life, for it is better for me to die than live. Why didn't Jonah want to go to Nineveh in the first place? Because he knew the Lord who had compassion on him would have compassion on his enemies. He knew the Lord that had compassion on him would have compassion on his enemies. And he didn't think that they deserved that. I, I imagine. 
imagine most of us, if not all of us, don't want to make a generalization here. We like to act like we want God to show love and mercy to everyone. You ever feel like that or pretend, yeah, I really want God to show love and mercy to, to everyone, but in reality, we don't. We don't. We want God to be merciful to us. We want God to show love to us. We don't want God to give us what we deserve. We want God's love and mercy. But to the people that we really don't like, to the people who make our lives difficult, to the people who cause harm, to people who are innocent, to the people who do injustice, to the people who everything comes so easy, we really want them to get what's coming to them. We want to be the exception. You ever feel that way? Jonah has this incredible encounter with God in the belly of a fish. I mean, you really can't do anything in a fish, but listen to God and pray and think, right? And he's, he's stuck in there and he prays. And you might think that that's all it would take to help a stubborn man become a surrendered man. But at the very end of the story, we see that Jonah is still stubborn. He's angry. Sometimes, again, don't want to make a generalization here, but I would say all the time, most of the time, it takes more than one encounter with God to transform our heart. So what are we to make of this long dramatic story that we just kind of skimmed through of these encounters that Jonah has with God? I have two takeaways for you. First, not every encounter with God is a bowl of lucky charms. They're not all happy and magical, uh, rainbows, balloons, what is it? Uh, hearts, horseshoes, all of those things. They're not happy and magical. I have this quote from Adele. She's a, a spiritual director and writer in your notes. She said, God is always also sending invitations. Sometimes they seem less compelling than anything on my to-do list. Why would I want to say yes to the invitation to rest when I'm already so far behind? Why follow when I could lead? Why accept invitations to weep or admit I am wrong or to wait? Saying yes may slow me down, sabotage my agenda, and even undo who I think I am. I have a feeling someone here needs to hear that sometimes God asks us to do things and it doesn't feel good. We're not going to Tarshish. I hate to break it to you, but this, Jesus, this journey with Jesus does not go to Tarshish. I know we like to think that it can because we live in uh, the Western world and we live fairly comfortably considering how other people live around the world. The way of Jesus is not the way of comfort. I think that's one reason why Christianity is growing in other parts of the world, but seems to be decreasing and not growing in the Western world. We like things to be comfortable, but the way of Jesus is not comfortable. And I know that this sounds like bad news, but it's actually really good news because chasing comfort is like chasing something that you'll never catch. It's like sailing to a city that doesn't exist. I may have told this story before, but it was a real turning point in my understanding of Jesus and the world. Someone that I went to high school with when she was 26 or 27 uh, died of stomach cancer. And both of her parents were doctors and she was in school to become a lawyer. Everything in her life was setting her up for health, for success, for comfort, but there is no guarantee of that. There is no way to secure that for yourself. We can't prevent suffering and pain from coming. I think that's one of the many things that we learned this year, that when a pandemic comes and you can't look forward to the vacation or the weekend margarita with friends, what do you have? 
That's why Jesus says, don't store up treasures on earth where moss and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal. Store up treasures in heaven, invest in eternity, invest in something that matters that you can count on that is stable. There is something more than comfort, something deeper, more fulfilling and more satisfying. God wants to turn your focus away from yourself, from your dreams and your goals. He wants to turn your focus away from empty material items, from comfort to something that will actually satisfy you, something that will last. But in the immediate, that does not always feel good. It might mean that you apologize to someone. It might mean you create new boundaries in a relationship. It might mean that you start practicing Sabbath. I know, but if you practice Sabbath, that means some of the work doesn't get done. And that means you have to sit with your mind that's just has like this endless to-do list and telling you to be productive. And it's so frustrating. It's not comfortable. I heard a, a story recently about this man who uh, found out that his wife was cheating on him with their next door neighbor. And he found out this man's birthday. And ever since then, every year on this man's birthday, he sends him an anonymous birthday gift as a way of loving his enemies. I have to imagine that does not feel very good. Sometimes God asks us to do things and it doesn't feel good, but just because it doesn't feel good doesn't mean it isn't good this is what jonah says in his prayer when he's in the fish those who cling to worthless idols turn away from god's love for them those who cling to worthless idols turn away from god's love for them god wants you to wants to turn you towards his love for you but it will not always feel comfortable Second takeaway, there is a lot wrong in the world right now. And I really don't want to downplay the suffering that's happening or the systematic injustice. But I do want to open your mind and heart to the possibility that the person who you despise right now, who you think is the problem, whoever that is, you know who it is, the person who you think is beyond God's reach, that is beyond transformation, God might want to do something in them. God might want to use you to do something in them. And you might be the only one standing in the way of it. Do you see the irony is in the story is that the people who are supposed to be evil, so misguided, so far off, so violent, repent and change far easier than Jonah does. They hear this small little sentence and they decide, oh my gosh, yes, we're so in the wrong. Jonah had to end up in the stomach of a fish to realize that he was doing something wrong. God might wanna do something in the life of the person who you despise, who you think is so far out of God's reach and you might be the only one standing in the way of it. G.K. Chesterton, he's this famous Christian speaker and author. There's this well-known story about him that the Times sent out this inquiry to famous authors asking the question, what's wrong with the world today? And all he said in return is, I am. Sincerely, G.K. Chesterton. I don't want to minimize the structural injustice in the world and the suffering that is happening, but I do want to ask you, is there someone you need God to soften your heart towards? Are you standing in the way of the transformation that God wants to do in someone's life? I believe that God is moving and active, that he's working and speaking right now. And so before I pray for us and close out this teaching, I'm going to pause for silence for God to speak to you about what God is showing you in this story. Is he inviting you to lean into something that is uncomfortable, that doesn't feel good, 
for your ultimate good? Does he need to transform your heart towards someone? Does he need to transform your heart towards him? Does he need to transform your heart towards yourself? What is God saying to you today? Take a moment and just listen to what God is saying to you through the story. God, uh, we are all on a journey. We're all on a journey toward the abundant life that you have for us, towards becoming more like you, a more authentic uh, representation of your love and who you are. And so because we're on a journey, God, I know that there are things that you were inviting us all into that feel uncomfortable, that feel like a challenge. And God, I pray that you would reveal those things to us so that you could lead us into deeper freedom, so that we could settle more deeply into the love that you have for us, so that we can bring other people along in that journey towards your peace. May the words that we heard here today, God, be more than words. May they manifest in the way that we live. Would we act on those, God, ultimately for the good of what you're doing in the world? We pray these things in your name. Sometimes the, the journey we take with Jesus, like it doesn't make sense to us, but we continue to follow Jesus because we trust that he is good. That the way that he has for us is good. Uh, I have this prayer for us that we're using in this series and I just wanna invite you with, with your microphone off to recite it with me. There's something about reciting as a way of embodying um, rather than just reading. Uh, so join me in, in praying this prayer. Our God has risen from the grave. He is moving and active with us in every moment, closer than the air we breathe, sharing our pain and anguish, establishing justice and peace. God, make us aware of how you are working, even when it makes us uncomfortable, and use us to be agents of your peace. Breathe life into us and make beauty from all that this broken 